uh, we'll be looking over the next half an hour or so at the subject of Holy Spirit gifts. So we'll first take a couple of minutes to look at some common misconceptions that we have, that we might have, regarding these gifts before we look at what the Bible tells us about their usage. And then we'll look at what that will mean for us. So common misconceptions. We'll start with the Catholic belief in these the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and the fear of God. And these are all taken from Isaiah chapter 11. So they are found in the Bible. But Catholics are taught from a young age that these gifts would be bestowed upon them at baptism and then strengthened at their confirmation so that they can, in their words, proclaim the truths of faith. However, some of the articles I was reading, many Catholics were disappointed that after their confirmation they hadn't been transformed into these all-wise, all-knowing soldiers of Christ as promised. So these, these gifts, as they're called here, are characteristics. They're not spirit gifts, but they're the manifestation of God's own spirit, which I believe through careful study and meditation on the inspired scriptures that we should all be striving to emulate. And we'll talk about this a bit later. Uh, so the next thing is faith healing. Again, this is something that is found in the Bible. There's lots of miracles that are performed to people who believe. And today there are people who claim to have this power of healing to draw massive crowds and followers. But they're sooner or later, they're all exposed, aren't they, as con artists. They're all exposed to be hoaxes. Many such faith healings are actually nothing more than the psychological phenomenon known as the placebo effect. Interesting, this man on the right, um, Rev Popoff, uh, was earning, in the 80s, he was earning $4 million a month from these so-called faith <laughs> healings. And it was later found out that his wife was feeding him information through an earpiece to, uh, on all these people that came up. Um, again, something else which I thought would, I could put, throw in under these misconceptions is that another Catholic doctrine of the artifacts and relics. Um, and we all know that they all have these, these, these holy artifacts, things like the Turin Shroud, which was later found out to be a hoax. But there's uh, a couple of years ago, a replica went up in America for two weeks, and this is, this is an old thing that has been found as a hoax. It still managed to draw 10,000 people in two weeks that it was in the, uh, on display. Other things, such as the mummified head of St. Catherine of Siena, the head of John the Baptist, they've all been used for centuries to draw crowds, to inspire millions of people into believing the Catholic, Catholic doctrine. But there's no real evidence uh, to support the view that these are in any way blessed with Holy Spirit gifts or powers. So what are Holy Spirit gifts? So we're going to look at this from a purely scriptural point of view. Uh, the Holy Spirit gifts as described in the Bible, I believe, are various gifts given by God to certain individuals at a particularly crucial time to promote the effective preaching of the gospel message, which is the good news of the kingdom of God. So the Greek word used here in Acts 2, chapter, uh, verse 38, for gift is means is a dorea, which simply means a gift or something that is given. So in this context, the Holy Spirit gifts are uh, can be described then as the transfer of God's power to specific individuals. And I believe there are three main periods in the Bible where God does this or will do this to achieve his purpose. And they're all at crucial times in Israel's history. So we're going to look at the first, which is in the time of Moses. So if you could turn to Numbers chapter 11, please. Uh, now Moses had quite a big job. He had to lead the people or the children of Israel through the wilderness. Um, I should probably turn there myself as well. Uh, so he, and I've, God gave, gave, gives him his spirit to help him do this. So Numbers chapter 11, uh, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be 
elders of the people and officers over them and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand with thee there and I'll come down and talk with thee there and I'll take of the spirit which is upon thee and will give it upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee that thou bear it not alone. So it's interesting that Moses, he's got this spirit gift, but he's being asked to pass it on to these 70 elders. He's not become a superhero because of it, these gifts. He still has, he still is human, and this power and responsibility was too much for him. So it was shared, and when they received it, in verse 25, the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto Moses and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it to the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. So this is again one of those gifts mentioned in our reading in Corinthians. So when does Moses first get this? So if we turn to Exodus chapter 3, we remember how before he leads these people, he was, only, he was just a shepherd in uh, Midian, and he, God appears to him in a burning bush. So Exodus chapter 3. Starting from verse 9. So God is speaking to Moses. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people out of Egypt. So Moses is being told to bring God's people out of Egypt and to deliver them. Verse 12. And God said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God upon this holy mountain. So to bring them out it was to be a sign or a token of God's power. So if you come on to chapter 4 and verse 2, we start to see these sort of spirit gifts appearing. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And Moses said, A rod. And he said, cast it on the ground, and he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod. But why would he, so why was he given these powers to, to change this rod into a serpent? We will read on in verse 5, that they may believe the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. So the whole purpose of these powers was so that the children of Israel would believe that God was coming to save them. And so we then get, don't we, the ten plagues of Egypt that were trying to convince Pharaoh to let the people go. Um, But this wasn't the only use of the Holy Spirit at this time. If you look at verse 15 of this chapter, uh, God is speaking to Moses again. And thou shalt speak unto him, this is Aaron, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do. So God was then going to use the Spirit to direct their mouths. In verse uh, 30 of this chapter, And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses, and did the signs in the sight of the people, and they believed, and when they had heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped him. So the outcome is that the people believed and then they are saved. They are led out of Egypt and are now journeying in the wilderness, which is where we picked it up in Numbers 11. Uh, So we take a quick look now at another group of people who had the Holy Spirit gifts at this particular time. And Exodus chapter 34, 35. starting at verse uh, 30. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, and of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. So their job, or his job, was to craft all the different parts of the tabernacle. And this was to be God's dwelling place and it was going to be the centre of their worship. So it was crucial that this was all done to God's specific plan and pattern. And so he uses his spirit in this way to accomplish this. Uh, If we now go to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Verse 
coming in at verse 7. And Moses was 120 years old when he died, and his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And jo Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded. So the spirit is passed on to Joshua, and he is then able to lead the people into the land. And you see this is a crucial time, is it? All the way from Egypt to the land, they're being led by people who were blessed with the Holy Spirit powers. And after this, there's not them passed on by hand to the next person, but we do get um, sort of pockets of people who, who had the Holy Spirit. So we have prophets like Enoch, we have uh, people like Abraham, David, and Isaiah, who, uh, from this, from Peter tells us that the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Spirit. Miracles were performed by Elijah and Elisha. But these pockets of prophecy and other spirit gifts were only... Uh, sort of very smallly concentrated in a short time, again for a specific purpose, which was to help the nation of Israel. But it wasn't as prolonged as it is here with Moses. And it's not until after the Jews returned from captivity in Babylon that they sort of stop completely, and you get that 400 years of silence from God. There's no Holy Spirit at all being t uh, used until just before the birth of Jesus. So if we turn to look at that next that's the second time the second big time that this the holy spirit is outpoured on a large group of people so we turn to luke chapter 2 so jesus being of the son of god would mean that he was going to be slightly different but it isn't until jesus is baptized that he actually gets the holy spirit if we read uh, verse 52 of Luke chapter 2 and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man so he hadn't got the Holy Spirit powers yet but he was starting to show those characteristics that the Catholics teach about the wisdom here so he this tells us then that we don't need those Holy Spirit powers now to emulate God's spirits um, and again we'll come on to that a bit later if we go down to chapter 3 of Luke uh, coming at verse 21 um, now when all the people were baptised, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptised and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee am I well pleased. This is when Jesus gets the Holy Spirit and it's a very visible manner. And he's then directed by it. Chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus being filled of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So why was he given this Holy Spirit power? Well, he tells this later on in chapter 4, verse 17. Uh, we'll start verse 16 for context. Um, and Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book... He found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath appointed, anointed me to teach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them which are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So his main objective then with these Holy Spirit powers is to preach the gospel and it's to heal the people and it's to save the nation, to bring salvation. So Jesus then does many miracles, doesn't he, during his ministry? And they're all there to support this main thing, which was to preach, to teaching people about the kingdom of God. So we turn to chapter 9 of Luke. He then, uh, like Moses, he passes this on to his disciples, verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. 
So again, they're being sent to preach the kingdom and to heal the sick, and it's always in that order. The Holy Spirit gifts were only used to aid the primary mission, which was to preach the good news of the kingdom, that many could be saved through Jesus' death and resurrection. And so if we look after that, at Mark chapter 16, after Jesus has been resurrected, he gives again the same, the same mission to his disciples, verse 15. And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And they, the disciples, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So again, their primary objective was to preach. And these signs, these miracles then, were used to confirm what they were preaching as being true. And this we then can pick up in Acts. So if we turn to Acts chapter 1. is the, a parallel record really of what we've just looked at but verse 8 of chapter 1 Jesus is speaking again to his disciples but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth so they're also then to be witnesses weren't they of Jesus his, his resurrection which was to be the first fruits of that what we believe will come in the kingdom, the, the, the mass resurrection of everybody. Um, and he's also being, they're also being sent to all the earth, aren't they? Not just to the Jews. Uh, so we have a look at chapter 2 of Acts, just over the page. We get Pentecost, uh, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all, the disciples were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there came unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is probably the most famous of all the outpourings of the Holy Spirit that we find. Um, but why were they given the, the Holy Spirit gifts? What was the purpose of that? Um, so Peter then gives his speech, and if we turn over the page, look at verse 41. Then they that were gladly received his word were baptised, and the same day were added unto them 3,000 souls. So the outcome here is that 3,000 people have believed on what they were saying, believed on their preaching, and were able to be baptised. Again, look at verse 43. And fear came upon every soul, and the many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Verse 47, they're praising God and having favour with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So all the time these, they were preaching and they were using these miracles so that many people could, be, uh, could come to the word and believe in it and be baptized and be saved. Uh, so then this was again supported by miracles. If we look at chapter 3, verse 2, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the te temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Verse 6, And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked, entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was him which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement to that which had happened unto him. So that was a massive support then for their preaching effort. They could see this man, which they all knew as the lame man who sat by the gate. They knew that he had been healed, and they knew who had done it, and they were all filled with wonder because of that. But their primary focus was still on preaching the kingdom. Chapter 4, verse 1. 
And as they spake unto the people, the priests and captain of the temple and Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And then the outcome of this, in verse 4, however, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. So they're still um, being able to preach and convert lots of people with this combined effort of preaching and Holy Spirit gifts. And the previous miracle that they used, uh, verse 14, and beholding the man which was healed and standing with them, they could say nothing against it. So they'd seen that man, they all knew that man, and because of that they couldn't say anything against their preaching because it had been confirmed by these signs. Uh, if you go on to then chapter, verse 31 of that, the more people are given the Holy Spirit. And when they were prayed and the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spake the word of God with boldness. Verse 33, and the great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So again, they were to be witnesses of Jesus by using these Holy Spirit gifts. I uh, should look into chapter, chapter 5 of Acts. And verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and the rest durst no man join to them, but the people magnified them, and believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing might overshadow some of them. So they all came because they believed what was being preached, and the miracles then were being performed, and they're an essential part of that early establishment of the faith in Judea. Uh, like Moses, the people need, like in, like in the time of Moses, the people needed to be shown the goodness and mercy of God. They needed to be shown that what they were preaching was true, and so this helps to establish God's word doesn't it, as being true in the eyes of them. So after this, we, the Apostle Paul comes onto the scene. Uh, if we turn to Acts chapter 14. And he starts then preaching to the Gentiles. He goes on all these missionary journeys to the Gentiles all throughout modern-day Turkey and Greece. Um, and he's, he's, also, he's converting them with these same signs and wonders. Verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they both went together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude both of Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So the Greeks at this time would have been mostly pagan, and so it needed to have been convinced that this... God that these Jews were talking about was actually a real God with powers. So the, this Holy Spirit is being used in a slightly different way. Instead of confirming to the Jews what's true, it's now convincing to the Greeks, to the pagans, that this God had was a real God. So after that, if we come on to chapter 20, he's gone throughout all this, all of... Greece and modern day Turkey and he's established ecclesias and now this spirit is being used again in a different way. Verse 17 Paul is speaking and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church uh, verse 28 so he's speaking to these elders take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So it's no longer just doing wonders it's now you know, they're trying to strengthen each other from their ecclesias. Um, and so this is where we get to our reading in 1 Corinthians 12, if we could turn there next. The ecclesias have been set up, and this Holy Spirit is now being used to uh, edify these early believers, to exhort them into unity within the ecclesia. So if we look at verse 4, 
Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Now are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Um, verse 11, but all these working that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So there are diversities and differences within the ecclesia, within the, their spirit gifts, but there is an exhortation there to being or to unity. The different members of the ecclesia were to work together. And so after this, they, the Holy Spirit gifts die out. The early ecclesias had been set up um, and were now gathering strength. Uh, the new covenant had been established, and there was, so there was a way that everyone could be saved by faith in Jesus. Um, so what remains now is the word of God, and that's to be a guide unto them. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So no longer needed the Holy Spirit gifts. They just could use the Bible to learn how to live their lives properly. And the, the, so the word of God then had the power to save. So again, that verse from 2 Peter, the holy men of God spake, so they're moved by the Holy Spirit. So they this inspired word. They had the power to save, and so that all that believed in it could be called the sons of God. Romans 8, verse 14, For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So we have to believe in his word. We have to learn about God's Spirit from it. And we have to try and emulate that in our lives, and then we can be called sons of God. So the third outpouring of the Holy Spirit is yet to happen yet. Uh, and we will be in the time of the kingdom, which we believe is a future age. And we can look at this in Hebrews chapter 6. That these gifts that they had now were nothing compared to what was going to be outpoured at the time of the kingdom. So if you read chapter Hebrews 6, verse, starting verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit, for it is impossible for those that were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world yet to come. So the writer here is looking forward, as not he, to the kingdom in which these Holy Spirits will be used on a, a scale that's not yet been seen. Um, so if we look now at, at a prophecy about that, so in Isaiah chapter 32, we look at the world around us today, don't we, and it's, it's not a pleasant place to live. And so we think there's, a got, there's got to be a lot of work that needs to be done before it's ever going to be as described in the Bible. So Isaiah 32, becoming uh, just for context, verse 13. Upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars, yea, upon all the houses of joy in the joyous city, because the palaces shall be forsaken, the multitude of the city shall be left, the forts and towers shall be for a den forever, a joy for wild asses and a pasture of flocks. So that's what it's like today, it's just run down, there's no, it's not well inhabited, um, there's thorns, it's, no, it's not a pleasant place to be. Verse 15, until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest, then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in peaceable habitation, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. So God will pour out his spirit then to transform our current world into this wilderness, uh, not wilderness, transform the wilderness into a fruitful field. As Ezekiel says similar things, first, uh, chapter 39, Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord. Uh, so 
what does that then mean for us? So we have seen, haven't we, that the Holy Spirit gifts were manifestations of God's own spirit. They were his power. And they were to accomplish a specific task, um, which was to establish the word of God, to direct influence so it could be established. What does that mean for us? If we go back to our reading in 1 Corinthians 12... But right now, we don't have the spirit. We don't have spirit gifts. We can't heal people in that sense uh, of those faith healings we saw from earlier, for example. But we believe that those who are faithful faithful will have them in the future, in the kingdom age, when God's purpose is uh, of filling the earth with his glory is fulfilled. But what we do have now, which is a product from the Holy Spirit, is God's word and this teaches us about the spirit of God and so with this we need to read it so that we can learn how to manifest God's character in our own lives and this whole chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is about spirit gifts and how they were to encourage people to work together though to edify each other verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 12 but covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I you a more excellent way in the next chapter, he goes on to talk about love. And this is ultimately what we need to be manifesting, God's love. And John tells us that God is love. And so we should be showing these characteristics, God's own spirit now, while we wait for the return of our Lord.